Damn, first there was middle of nowhere stories, now total isolation ghost stories. All by myself. The Man. I worked at a really remote archery range for a few summers. The hike to it is a mile back from our main campsite, which is in a remote location on a mountain to begin with. I went out early to set up, got bored, decided to fire off a few shots on my own before the students arrived. I shot about five or six arrows before I noticed a man standing down range. Immediately stopped what I was doing and called to him to let him know he couldn't be there. People were coming. This was a firing range. Dude just stood there, but there was something about it that made my hair stood on end. He was an Alaska native man, round eyes, strong brow ridge, eyes shadowed by his eyebrows kind of look, round jaw, kind of bow shaped lips, wearing a really basic kind of outfit, like a suede sack with a tattered kind of edge on the bottom. Not at all like the elaborate things you usually see people in native dress wearing. No fur trim, no big stitching, no colorful beads, just really just worn and plain and kind of dirty. Dude was fairly tall. We had a really nice heavy backdrop to catch the longer arrows up, and he was pretty close to the line down the middle, so shy of six feet, but not by a lot. He wasn't as round as most of the natives I know, Dude was pretty thin, with his hair all back. It kind of looked like dreads, but wasn't. More like braids, after they've been that way a while, and I've started to get loose flyaways. Maybe a little matted. He just stood there. No acknowledgement, no change in his expression. He just had this really hard look, like he was maybe clenching his teeth. Freaked me out. Fortunately, I heard voices coming up the trail. I told him again that people were coming, and again, nothing. Then I asked if he needed me to call someone for him. He just... He just vanished. Poof. Gone. Found out later that... Our property backed up against traditional native lands, currently owned by a native corporation. I've always wanted to ask more about it, but... I've worked there several years and never saw him again. I'm not really sure what I would even say or who I'd ask. Sleep Paralysis Episodes When I was around 11 years old, I lived with my mom, brother, and stepdad in a rural part of AL. My mom worked very close by at a fireworks factory. So close, I could see the building from our house. A few years back, that plant had an accident and two people were killed. One of them was my mom's friend and co-worker, Jeff, who we had never met. When this happened, we were living even closer to the plant in a tiny trailer. We moved into the newer house shortly after the accident. Our old trailer was so close to the blast that our windows were all shattered, and my mom viewed it as a safer location, and this one had just been recently vacated. I promise there is a reason for the seemingly pointless details. So, now that it's, the scene is painted a little bit, here's my story. My mom and stepdad were both at work, and I'd just come in from playing outside with my brother and our friends. He decided to stay at our friend's house, and I just wanted to come home and watch TV and get some lunch. So, I'm sitting in my stepdad's recliner, which is in the den, and it is parallel to where my bedroom is, about 15 feet away. I could see the small hallway that connects the laundry room to the den and to my bedroom, in my peripheral. My bedroom was located on the far end of the house, away from the other bedrooms. Anyways, in my peripheral, I see someone walk from my laundry room, out into the den, and into my bedroom. 
It was a small distance, so it happened quickly. I turned my head to look. Just in time to catch someone with long brown hair and a white t-shirt with blue jeans walk into my room. But I just got to see their back, not the face. I, I assumed it was my mom and thought it was weird she didn't come in through the front door and that she said nothing and went into my room. Confused, I got up and walked to my bedroom saying, Hey mom, you're home early. And as I rounded the corner of my doorframe, realized my lights were off and there was no one in there. I instantly got a cold chill and goosebumps and bolted out of my house to my neighbors. When my mom got home, I told her about it and she got real quiet and said, You got long brown hair? To which I was like, yeah, it looked like you from the back. I thought it was you. And then she said, well, honey, I guess it's time to tell you that this house used to belong to Jeff, my friend who died. That's why we were able to move in, because he passed away and the house came up for rent. People always got us confused with each other at work when our backs were to them, because our hair was so similar. So you saw my friend Jeff. Don't be afraid. He was a really nice guy, and I'm sure is a nice ghost now. So I didn't really worry about it. And I didn't see anything after that. Though, we we think he liked to play a prank on us every now and then. He would hide our salt and pepper shakers right before it was time for dinner. He did this a multitude of times, and I always assumed it was my stepdad and my mom just messing with us. But years later, when she would have no reason to keep the joke up, my mom still sticks to it being Jeff and not them. Even though my sighting wasn't negative, and I do think Jeff was a benevolent spirit, that is the only house I ever got sleep paralysis in. And it's happened more regularly than I cared for. I'd say about at least once a month for the entire four years we were there. My mom always told me that it was just the brain waking up before the body, but that didn't make it any less terrifying. I swore every time that there was someone in the room with me and on a few occasions i vividly remember seeing shadows on my ceiling that looked like two or three people walking around my room i know this is a common theme with people who experience this but i still think that there was something more ma ma malevolent haunting my house specifically my room it never happened to anyone else in my house and hey maybe jeff was walking in there to try to make it leave if i'm right about that Regardless, the sleep paralysis episodes were the most terrifying experiences of my life that are the main reason that at 27 years old, I still sleep with some sort of light in my room. Haunted Drive I was driving home from work last night. I work third shift and get off at 3.30 a.m. I live a little over an hour from where I work, and most of my drive takes me through the underpopulated rural countryside in South Carolina. Most nights are uneventful. The roads are deserted. There's nothing around but me and the numerous deer. Really, that's the only thing I worry about. Which night will I finally hit a deer, going 60 miles per hour, down a dark road at oh dark 30 in the morning? I mean, honestly, if I hit a deer in my ragtop, he's liable to be riding shotgun with me. Last night started out normal enough. Started my drive home. High beams on scanning for Bambi and his posse. About 3.45 a.m., I pass one of those homemade memorials marking the spot of a fatal accident. At the time, this didn't seem relevant to me, but looking back on it now, it might very well be important to note. So, about a quarter mile from the cross in the woods, my high beams caught the back of a young man walking down the road. He wasn't hitchhiking, just, just minding his own business walking down the road. I was thinking, who goes for a stroll this late at night or early in the morning. I drove past him, 
I glanced in my rearview mirror as I sped by, looking at his face, which was lit up by my taillights. He was so white, pale white. I caught sight of his eyes for the briefest moment. They just looked hollow. I assumed it was just the shadow of his brow from my taillights. Again, I thought it was weird, but didn't really register it as an important detail at the time. After he was out of sight, I started feeling really cold. I turned on the heat, but still, the temperature in the car felt chilly. I kept feeling like some someone was sitting next to me, but when I would glance over there, there was no one there. After several more minutes of this feeling, I started seeing something move in the reflection of the passenger side window. Still, there was nothing moving in the car. I just kept seeing movement in my peripheral vision, like someone shaking their leg. I felt uneasy. I felt nervous. Jittery. I happened to look up at the rearview mirror again, and my eye noticed something else strange. The light that indicates whether the passenger airbag is active wasn't lit up as off the way it should have been when the passenger seat is vacant. As in, someone was sitting in the seat next to me. My brain processes, and I felt my heart skip and chills ran through my body. I pulled up over at a deserted gas station and got out of the car for about five minutes. When I got back the nerves to get back into the car and investigate, the uneasy feeling was gone. I cranked it up and got back on the road. The passenger airbag light was lit up as off. The heat was working again. I wasn't seeing movement out of the corner of my eye anymore. This whole experience really shook me up. What my grandfather saw. My grandfather was an RCAF pilot during World War II. His plane was brought down a number of times during the war. One of those times, he experienced something he could only ever explain as being supernatural. His plane was shot down in Germany. It was a hazy evening and hard to see a whole lot. Another group has recently bombed near the area he was flying through. He and another plane went down in a forest. The other pilot did not survive. My grandfather was trying to find somewhere he could hide out while the German planes were still in the air. He heard someone crying. He understood that most casualties of war were innocent civilians, so he went to find who was crying to see if he could help them. It was very dark out, when he found a little girl who, with cuts on her face and covered in dirt and ash. He didn't speak German fluently yet, but he knew enough to know she was asking for help. He followed her through the woods for a while. He couldn't see very much because there was still a lot of ash still in the air. Everything smelled burnt and dead. He always said that's what everything always smelled like during the war. Burnt. Dead and sometimes moldy. They came to what was left of a small farm in the forest. They were very near a small town, the one that had been bombed. A bomb had hit the farm. Everything was broken and collapsing. The girl led him to the front door, which was half broken off and went inside. When he went inside, he couldn't find her. The little girl was gone. He was very afraid, but he had nowhere to go. And it was in the middle of the night, so he stayed hidden in the house until morning. In the morning, he discovered that there were several bodies around the farm. There was a man, a woman, and three young girls. One of the girls looked like the one who had led him to the house. She had been crushed by a piece of the wall. He buried the bodies and went back to his plane to see if he could radio for help. He said that before that time, he never believed in the supernatural. Before the war, he just started teaching in a school. He was married and had children. His life was very normal. After the war, he said he started to see and hear things he could not explain. It's likely it was caused by his PTSD, but 
He always denied that it had anything to do with his PTSD. And everything to do with staying in that house that night. Voodoo on a Lonely Road In high school, my friends and I spent most of our time driving around and getting high. I've always lived in North Dakota, if you've ever been there. I'm guessing not. We have rolling hills, valleys, and a lot of flat country. Of course, we had our own set of urban legends. One of them being somewhere out in the country, there is a place where a scary satanic cult meets to sacrifice animals and be weird and freaky. And I'd also heard stories from the Native American kids I went to school with about animal sacrifice and special ceremonies with animal spirits. I never thought anything of it. We always took the same 45 minute drive on back roads around our city. That way, we didn't have to worry about cops. Everything is desolate with a farmer's house here and there. There was a small patch of roadway that curved through hills and trees. It was always creepy anyways, just the way the trees crept over the roadway and basically being in the ass crack of two hills. We never had anything too spooky happen to us until one day, we pulled off the road onto an approach and about 50 feet into some trees to not be seen and got out of the car to smoke a cigarette since the driver hated cigarette smoke. We pulled up by a fence and as we're smoking, looking around, we saw we saw something on the fence about another 50 feet down from us. We walked down there and turns out there were eight different animal skulls strung up on the fence. All different kinds. I could tell one was a deer, one was a fox badger, and a smaller one I could tell was some sort of gopher thing. And then the smallest was a bird. All around there were piles of bones, all different sizes, sorted, like leg bones, rib bones, back bones, etc. It was strange, but we chalked it up to freaky hunters or pouchers who had some weird bone hobby or something like that. We weren't really freaked out at this point, and we hung around there for another half hour or so looking around for any more odd stuff. Didn't really find anything but some pheasant feathers stuck out in the ground a few feet away. Two days later, it's early evening in the summer, while coming around the curve, just before the approach we had pulled into days before. Our headlights hit a man in a black trench coat and a hood. As soon as our lights hit the man, he stopped moving and just stood there. As best as we could see him, he just stood there until we had went around the next curve. We would see this guy every couple of days. Most of the time, he would just keep walking. We never saw his face or knew what, what, what he was doing walking out in the middle of literally nowhere. Then, we start seeing the cat in the same curve of the road. Just a cat sitting off to the side, staring at the road like a creepy freak. The first day, we just kept driving, but the second time we stopped and tried to call it to the car or scare it away from the road, but it would not look up. Its neck was hunched, bent over as if it was broken, really creepy. A few more days went by, and we kept seeing creepy trench coat man and freaked out weird cat. We kinda started feeling like we were being watched, so we decided to switch our route, you know, to avoid being potentially skinned and eaten or sacrificed. After about two weeks, we decided to go back to that route, because the alternate route had heavier traffic and more houses, and we liked to be alone. We take our time. The speed limit is 35, but we're going 25. As soon as we come around that curve, boom. Wall of paranormal. Brakes slam on, screaming and what the fucking are happening. What I'm about to describe happened in about 1.5 seconds. My friend slams on the brake because of a deer, but it wasn't a deer. Not alive anyways. It was way up in the air. Higher than a deer would jump. It was see-through, like 
had a kind of dull green glow, much different than the light of our headlights. It had legs but no feet. Then a huge thing that I could only describe as a huge butterfly-type creature hit the windshield. It was so huge that the body hit right in front of me, and the wings spanned all the way around the edge of the driver's side. They had the same strange glow as the deer, but a little bit brighter white, and obviously from the sound of it hitting, much more tangible, physical. We sat there stopped in the road for a few seconds, making sure we all saw the same thing, which we did. Then, I shined my awesome foam flashlight into the trees, hoping I would see a live deer, and we were all just losing our minds or super high. But I saw nothing, except for an animal skull on a post. We went back the next day, during the daytime. Didn't really find anything, but there were salamanders all over the road, by where our skid marks were. We had to run them over, there were so many. That road is closed now. I'm guessing because the creek kept overflowing and washing out the pavement.